Okay, my, uh, welcome to my session. Uh, my name is Mita Mitreski. I come from uh, Macedonia. Uh, I'm the job leader of, of Java User Group Macedonia for the past uh, six years. Um, I work for this uh, little Dutch consultancy company in uh, in Netherlands, and um, also I try to contribute to various open source projects. Um, lately, I'm uh, part of the expert group for JSR374, the JSON processing API. Um, today, I wanted to share um, something that uh, I use quite often in almost every project that, that I work for. And um, that's uh, something called Google Guava. Uh, the title of the talk is The Core Libraries You Always Wanted. Um, it's something I believe it's uh, quite essential for, for uh, most of the enterprise projects that we have today. OK, so uh, what's Guava? Uh, OK. Let's see. Hmm. Yeah, okay. So Guava is a, it's a plant. It's not really common in our area. A lot of vitamin C. But of course, I won't be talking about the plant. Um, I'll be talking about Google Guava. Uh, Google Guava is a set of various utilities. Um, you have probably written most of this in your projects. Um, but these are actually uh, something that comes as a library. Um, as you can notice, uh, most of these are quite similar to the ones we can find in the, in the JDK. As you can see, we have annotation, we have some of the base classes, we have uh, utilities for input, output, and so on. Um, there will be quite a lot of code in the slides. Um, I'm always like the demo night nightmare, so I didn't want to risk it. Um, as it turns out, the, the power is not working at the moment, <laughs> but yeah. We'll see how long the battery will last. Um, yeah, um, so really, a few facts about Guava. The latest release is 18.0. Uh, um, it's in August 2014. The project is quite alive. Uh, so th there is another release planned this year. Uh, if you open up the GitHub repository uh, of the project, you can see that there are commits from this past week. So it's quite a live uh, project. Um, it's uh, something that uh, Google has provided to the public, a uh, combination of sort of internal utilities they, they used, and they made it uh, uh, public. It's a Apache 2 license, so it's quite permissive to, to use in pretty much any project that you want to use. Um, um, the presentation that I'm going to be talking about is certain aspects of the Guava library uh, that I find it useful, so it's not going to be every possible detail, because there is a lot of it. Uh, and we will see some of the problems this um, um, library helps us with. One of the problems in Java is null, really. Um, if, if you see some the co quote from Doug Lea, uh, Doug Lea, for those of you who do not know, is uh, uh, one of the guys behind most of the concurrency um, concurrency classes in, in the JDK. Uh, he's also a professor in uh, one of the US universities. It's a really direct quote from him. It's like, null sucks, really. It does suck. Um, you, if you also see the first person who actually introduced null in any of the languages, uh, that's Tony Hoare. Um, he's the same guy that has invented Quicksort. So um, he says that that's his billion dollar mistake. Um, what really is the problem with null? The main problem for me, actually, for null, is it's that it's not uh, clear what, what null means, actually. If you take a look at Boolean, for example, we have a Boolean variable. It's awesome. It can be null, true, and false. So what's null? Is it false? Is it really not true? Is it not false? Is it? It's not really clear. Just by looking at the variable, you do not know what, what the null value means for, for, for Boolean. It doesn't make any sense. We have all actually written a code like uh, the second part. We have all written code where, where we say, I don't know, um, if x is not null and x dot sum method is not null, then we can actually call x dot sum method. That's one of the ways to, to tackle the nullness. We always check. The other way is to do this like defensively, like call defensively. And at the beginning of the method, we can say like assert not null. 
assert not now this, and so on, and throw a certain exception or check the state. That's also OK, but it can happen that we have already checked in a previous method that this value is not null, and now we are checking that again and again and again. And you can see this throughout the any, any uh, code base of any, any uh, major application. Um, one way to tackle this uh, is uh, something called the optional class. Um, the optional class is kind of like wrapper around a value, a thing, so it must be something like an object, uh, at least for now. Um, so an optional gives the intention that my method is returning something that may not be there. So it's quite clear, actually. It's something that may, may be absent. It's not null. It's something that may be absent. It may, you may need to check the value of this. This may be absent. It gives it quite clear to the user of our method that the thing that we are returning must be checked for nullness. So the one way to structure your application is to say everything is not null. There is no null in our code, except we can return optional, where, the, where we actually need to return an absent value. In that way, we don't need to have this defensive coding in each of the methods. Um, one sort of bad practice is to have um, optionals in, in method parameters. So if you have optional in method parameters, then you're sort of like masking the problem once again. So someone may ac accidentally pass null, right? So that, that, that is a problem. Basically, before getting any um, value, we must check either is present. So if we are using dot get on an optional, we must check is present. But we shouldn't really use dot get that often. We should use some possible value or something else or something else. This is one way to sort of uh, fix the nullness. Guava has a lot of other utilities that, that help around nullness. We have all written code like this, like the first example, where we actually go through, through uh, a method and say, like, if this method is different than null, then call the method and otherwise return some default value. Um, this is quite simply done in, in Guava, like objects, first not null. Return the first value that's not null. It's quite simple, actually. We say, if objects first not null of null and 3, it will be evaluated to 3. First not null of 9 and 3, it will be 9. It's a subtle change, but it's a lot clearer than doing an if statement or, I don't know, ternary operator uh, in Java. There are a lot of these small utilities in Go. Um, we also have the precondition class. If we do still decide to use the defensive coding, also we, uh, for some, sometimes, uh, actually quite often, we need, we need to check the, some impossible state, like say in our method, if this uh, method is called with this state, then don't even evaluate it. So they, we, we can have this check not null, check state methods that are available in the preconditions library. These are quite similar to the to the Apache Commons uh, library that, that, that's quite used in the quite older project, let's say. Uh, even though the Apache Commons are still actively developed as well. Um, another option to tackle the nullness uh, in our applications uh, is to use the JSR uh, 305. This, this provides annotations for software uh, fault detection. At the moment, this at the moment, actually in the past three or four years, this is not an active JSR, even though the annotations are quite simple and uh, widely used. Um, they, they can be found as the standard JavaX, um, uh, uh, JavaX annotation, not null. Uh, that, that's are the, the ones from the JSR. But there are also various other forms, like the one from IntelliJ. We have also the, the ones that are used in Hibernate for validation of nullness and, uh, and so on, for build validation. Uh, there are also notations from find bugs, but essentially they do the same thing. They provide us a mechanism to, to test the nullness. So we can test the nullness at compile time using some annotation processor. So uh, find bugs uh, uh, has this. Uh, it provides automated testing of, of, of null. So it can say, yeah, okay, in this area, you may have null value. 
Um, these are actually, the GSR 3 or 5 is the only dependency on Goava. Goava has this internally. So for, for method parameters, they use the annotations. They use null, uh, nullable and not null. Uh, but for return types, it's always an optional, if we actually have an optional. Realistically, we don't always need to have uh, an optional values. We don't always have to, 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 um, to rely on something that, that may or may not be absent. We can uh, always kind of return something. Uh, it doesn't have to be something that's absent. But this is also another, another way to tackle problems. Um, actually, most of the um, uh, IDEs at the moment have automated uh, checks for this. Yeah, Eclipse, IntelliJ, and Edwins ha have automated checks that, that uh, pick up these annotations. On some of the IDEs, you might need to configure this. Uh, and install additional plugins, but still there is something that automatically checks the nullness of certain areas. So this will allow you to have uh, less null pointer exceptions. But wait, like JDK 8 also has optional. That's true. But Guava actually supports JDK 6. Uh, it supports also additionally GWT and uh, also supports uh, Android. So. Uh, best of my knowledge, I'm not an Android guy, but best of my knowledge, uh, for, for, for Android, uh, there is still no JDK 8, right? So uh, at the moment, uh, it, we are stuck on older versions. So if you want to have certain functionalities like this, you still need to use something like this. Um, really, um, Guava evolves as the language evolves as well. So in the later versions, where they predicted that this thing is going to be added in JDK 8, they created a, a class called more objects, and they sort of put a label on the old objects class, like don't use this one, use the one from the JDK, because this will be eventually removed when we choose not to support JDK 6. So basically, whenever there is class in JDK, actually JDK 8 mostly, like use the JDK class. It's the same concept, completely the same concept. Actually, the JDK uh, classes were inspired by Goala if you were leading the mailing lists. Um, it's, it's there, actually. It's been there for quite some time. The one thing I really like about Guava is the API deprecation. It's something that um, allows them to, to sort of um, evolve the code base. Um, the one of the biggest problems with Java that everyone is complaining about nowadays is that there are tons of deprecated methods since 2000, even before 2000, from Java 1.1, that are still not removed. If we take a look at the date classes, um, right, I mean, uh, to create a, a, a new date, most of the methods are deprecated because they're quite really um, ambiguous and, and have dual meanings. And, um, but they have been deprecated for 10 years, 15 years, actually even more, and they're still not removed. The Goava team kind of removes this type of stuff. When they do a mistake, they remove part of the code. But this is like a problem. If this is a utility library and you're using it in every project, then it means that you also must change everything that they have removed. Well, they actually have warnings for this. They are not just like removing random stuff. Um, basically, any part of the API that's annotated with beta, it's subject to change at any time. This has happened to me several times that I have used something that was annotated with Meta, and then I'm migrating to a new version of Guava, and then it's either missing or has a completely different signature. And that's quite expected, but then you, you, you are aware that this might happen for the Beta annotated API. Not, not much of the code base is annotated with Beta, but still most of the newer functionalities are like that. There is also the deprecated word. So in Java, yes, a lot of stuff are deprecated, but they're not removed ever. Here, there is a warning, like 18 months, that's it. After 18 months, you had enough time to actually migrate. If not, this will be removed. It's not always removed exactly in 18 months, but this is the warning. They say 18 months, it's one we guarantee. This will be the supported time period of the library, which is kind of fair. The other sort of big thing that, that uh, allows them to, to evolve the API is that serialization is not um, completely backwards compatible. 
Uh, Brian gets was asked uh, on DevOps this year, uh, what's the biggest problem, what's the worst feature that uh, he, he thinks of in Java? And he said that that's the serialization. Uh, why is that, actually? It technically restricts them to evolve the API. They cannot do certain changes on the API just because of the serialization. Because if they do certain change, the older version may not be compatible with the newer version of the same class. So they actually cannot do a lot of changes in the code base just because of this. And it is the most hated feature there. And Goava basically says, we have no guarantee. They usually give out warnings for certain classes that you should not use them in serialization or you should write your own custom way of doing this. But yeah, it's kind of fair enough. For, for at least for, for my use, it's fair enough that, that serialization is not, uh, not guaranteed. One other sort of thing that that's, can be quite difficult to write is when we are writing comparator. Actually, the writing of the comparator is quite simple, right? In Java, you write the comparator. I don't know if it's zero, then they are equal. If one, if it, we return positive value, then it's like bigger. If it, if it returns negative, then it's smaller. But yeah, you're gonna write it down. Then someone else comes in. He needs to read that. You're returning some number. Like it's really. It can be really difficult to sometimes to understand what the comparator does. Um, Goala provides something called uh, orderables, which, which kind of provide the same functionality, but it's a lot more clear. In this example, we have ordering of customers, so it's natural ordering. So it means that it's alphabetical. The nulls will be moved on the top, because in your comparator, you may not have covered the scenario with the nulls, right? Usually, that's one of the mistakes when writing comparator. We do not cover the scenario what happens if both of the objects are null. Do we put them on the top? Do we put them on the bottom in the sorting? And result of certain function. And at the moment, we are really comparing by name, right? We are ordering by name. Because uh, name is a string in a, some kind of customer object. And yeah, name has some kind of natural ordering. Really quite simple and obvious. Whoever comes and reads this, it's quite obvious what it does. There, in, there aren't any hidden mechanisms for the nulls or, or so on. If someone wants to change certain functionality, like reorder, uh, reorder them and reverse them, it's quite simple, actually. It's really, really straightforward. There are also tons of utilities regarding the wrapper clusters. So, I mean, but with the wrapper clusters in Java, we're pretty much covered with most of the functionality that we need. Unfortunately, in Java, there isn't any support for unsigned numbers. In most of the business applications nowadays, really, we don't need unsigned numbers, right? But if you're doing something that connects to a certain device or connects to some kind of um, ha hardware mechanism or, I don't know, some driver, usually you get stuff that are written in C. And then you need to provide some kind of mechanism to, to, to use these unsigned uh, numbers. Uh, there, there is utilities for that. Uh, they pack the number in larger numbers. So if it's an integer, they pack it in a long. But then, then they have these additional operations that provide you the functionality of uh, having unsigned numbers in Java. Analog to the wrapper classes, there are other utility classes. So if it's integer, it's ends. If it's, I don't know. Short, it's shorts. It's always with an S on the end. Uh, all of the additional utility classes in Goava are always like with additional S. So you, you, can you can always search for something that you have in the JDK, and you're missing a method in the JDK. Just try add an S, see if it's in Goava. It's most likely there. <clears throat> Tons of other uh, stuff that are quite useful are char the character matchers. Um, we really need to always, always, really often to, to, to check when we're doing some validation and so on, that, I don't know, the number that we have inputted is a valid ASCII, or remove all the Unicode characters, or to check uh, if it contains just digits, and so on. What we usually do is use the regex, right? But when you read the regex, it's really difficult to understand at the moment, for me at least. When I, when I see, I don't know, slash W, I always wonder, was it the bigger W? Was it the white character, non-alphameric? Was it the other one? Uh, it always gets 
kind of hard, really. You need to always look up. I always look up whenever I'm reading a, a bigger regex. I always look up what it does. You don't need to do that. You have these values of built-in character measures. You can actually write your own character measures. But you have these this built-in ones that cover major portion of the functionality. And they're quite composable. You can have negated, um, uh, negated value of what the character matcher matches. And it's quite straightforward when you're reading it to notice what it actually does. Um, for example, I don't know. Um, if you want to remove the digits from a string, like character matcher digits, it will match whatever the digits are in the string. And just remove, like character matcher digit retain from, retain from that string. Uh, I don't know. Put it to lowercase. Remove just the lowercase. Remove just the uppercase. Uh, make it, uh, uh, I don't know, ISO compatible. Make it UTF compatible. All of these functionalities are are built in in this kind of measures. You don't have to bother yourself with it. Another big thing actually that we usually need is, in most applications, is caching. Now, what Go provides is uh, uh, something called cache builders that have uh, different type of caches. The most common ones are something called loading caches. Now, just to be clear, these are not distributed caches. These are just your uh, local application cache caches. If you need distributed caches, I don't know, take a look at Hazelcast or tons of other products out there. OK, so let's get back on the cache. It's quite simple to build a cache in, in, uh, inside, uh, inside using Go. We have cache builder. We say like maximum size 10,000. Just build it. We have the cache inside. There are, OK, but that's like the ba most basic thing with a cache. I can use a map for that, right? I don't really need this. There are tons of other stuff that we can add during the building of the cache. One of the things that we usually concern ourselves with is the eviction, right? When when the objects will get removed from the cache. We have these utilities in Go. We have like expire after this much of period. Expire after, I don't know, two minutes. Expire after accessing. When you access it and then remove it, so on. You can add notifications for removal. You can add listeners for, for all of this. There are tons of other stuff that you can do on top of the standard, standard wrappers. There is the option to add custom size dependent on a custom property from within the map. So you can set like a waiter. A waiter is something that, that gives a, a value of weight. And then we actually must provide also something called maximum weight. In this case, it doesn't really make sense. But when we have a customer that has bigger, uh, bigger what's in this case, name than 20 characters, then something will be removed from the cache because we already sort of maxed out depending on our custom function. So I don't know. If we put zero, then it's OK. If we put something that has a length, a customer that has name length with more than 21, then something else will be removed from the cache, and this new customer will be placed inside there. This provides us a lot of flexibility to sort of fine tune our, our caching. Um, <clears throat> one other, other cool feature of the Guava cache is that we can enable weak keys. So weak keys means that there will be weak references uh, within the internal representation. This means that if we put something inside the cache and the garbage collector needs to remove it, it will remove it. Why is it this useful? This is useful for, not, for us not to create memory leaks. So let's say you are in a web application. You are caching requests for some reason. You want to cache them as a key, right? Put them in the, in the key for some reason. If you, if you still contain the reference to the key that's in the cache, even though nobody else uses this reference, the garbage collector will not remove it, because your cache is holding a reference to an object that nobody else uses, but even though it's not really needed. So actually, you need to be quite careful that you, you know what actually this does. but. Uh, it, it's actually quite simple. If you, if you need a uh, uh, value or, or key, actually, there is also weak values. If you need a value or weak key that, that will not be used by anyone else and you want the garbage collector to remove it, use this. 
the garbage collector will automatically re remove this from your own cache. <coughs> OK, so we build this cache. Now we not want to know actually if it does any good to us. right? We want to know if, if we are actually uh, getting some, some cache hits or we are just like caching new stuff and removing old stuff, if someone is actually, if any of the stuff are used. Now, there is something called cache statistics. This is usually just for debugging purposes or maybe some kind of analytics that you want to do. Uh, the builder provides something called record stats. So when you are pressing record stats, then on the cache you can call dot stats method. This will give you cache statistics method. There you have, I don't know, hit rate, a number of hits, number of misses, and so on. You can get a, a nice overview of how well your cache operates. This is very, very nice, actually. Now, previously, actually, in the past, I usually used map to do most of this stuff. For the most basic functionality, yes, map may be sufficient. But then you get into concurrency issues. Then you need to implement all of this and reinvent actually something that's available and quite well tested. Um, really, um, you need to concern yourself about concurrency, right? Uh, map get is not really, uh, it leaves a hole in between the operation. When you get a map get, then you, you do some processing. That whole part needs to be synchronized, right? Um, also, there is the problem where the, the map is rising, the equals method is not really uh, working as the way you usually think that it does work. Okay, so that was about the cache. Um, there is this whole package called collect. Um, historically, it originated from, from something called Google Collections, but it was uh, integrated with in the within Guava actually reduced version of Google Collections. So it provides additional implementations of the standard collections API. Up there are, I don't know, multi-maps, immutable collections, uh, tons of other utilities related to collections. Um, there is also quite a lot of functional programming support. Technically, we do have that in, uh, in Java 8, but a lot of this is done actually for Java 6. Even though it's done for Java 6, of course, it still works on, on Java 8. Um, <clears throat> quite often, we have written like list that contains string, uh, actually, so, sorry, not list, a map that contains uh, a key of string and a value of list, right? And then you get these huge generic blobs that that's really uh, completely ununderstandable. There are tons of it uh, built in uh, multi maps. So, for example, array list multi map, that means that we actually have a hash map. It is a hash map, but inside the values are actually array lists. The naming convention is quite similar hash multi map, right? Hash map, but it has a set inside. A link hash multi map, link hash set, and so on. Um, they're quite analogs to the standard Java collections and provide a lot of more utilities because these structures are slightly more complex and uh, you need sometimes to have bigger operation of this. The one I quite often need, actually, is something called BMAP. It's like bidirectional map. It, um, you cannot have duplicate values, but you also cannot have duplicate keys. And additionally, it provides you a way to sort of invert it, so the values to become keys and the keys to become values. Uh, I don't know, for, for some reason, I, I, I often need this. Um, yeah, the other way that it behaves uh, that's different uh, than the other maps is that it throws illegal argument exception if you attempt to put a duplicate uh, value of something that, that's because it's not possible to put duplicate values because of the inverse, uh, inverse uh, mechanism. Okay, <coughs> so there are quite a few functional aspects in, in Goala. There are things called functions and predicates. They kind of simulate to what the lambdas do today. Um, there is like a function that is applied uh, on a string and an integer. So the first argument is always the return argument. So um, the first argument is the, the, the return value. And the second argument is uh, 
Actually, the other way around, sorry. The, the first argument is the, the method argument, and the second argument is the return value. Uh, the predicates, on the other hand, are something that we apply only to one, uh, uh, one type. And it, it, they return a Boolean, always return a Boolean, because they are predicate. Uh, obviously, in Java 8, this is, looks a lot simpler, actually. This, this same code would look like this. We would just use direct method references, right? Uh, it's a lot simpler this way. And additionally, we don't even need the Guava classes there. We can use the built-in function and predicate classes. But of course, that means that we are working on JDK 8. A lot of the functions, if not all of the functions in Guava, are really um, uh, something called single abstract method, actually something that's susceptible to being a lambda. So almost all of the, the methods and interfaces within Guava are really uh, more or less uh, stamps. They are, they are single abstract methods. Um, if you were to compare what, what methods from Guava ended up in, in JDK, you would, we would see that we have the predicate, we have the optional, um, we have also the, the joiner, uh, splitter classes, the supplier, and so on. These are just a few of those, actually. But they are more or less the same. I mean, the packages are different, but they are more or less the same. They, they provide the same functionality. Uh, on the other hand, the JDK classes are quite better because they are integrated and well thought of to be work within the whole platform. So they added a lot more methods, a lot more functionality surrounding those. So just use the JTK8 classes if they are available to you. Um, <clears throat> OK, so um, quite often we have some collection, and we want to remove certain values depending on some condition. For, for example, we have this um, map, and we want to remove from that map whatever val uh, values that, uh, whatever entries that have null values. One way to do this is you use the maps. You notice the S, so it's a map. Maps, int, int. Int is the, the Guava class. Maps is the Guava class. So maps filter values. We filter the values of that map depending on some condition. So the predicate is not null. So this will remove, will, will filter out all the uh, uh, null values. At the end, we will have the three Num uh, the, the three leftover values that are not, not null. There are tons of these filters uh, that there are usually in, in the iterables, iterators, uh, classes, uh, yeah, but they're also in the sets, in the maps, and so on. You have this filter that accepts the, something that's iterable, and then you have the predicate. Quite simple. Actually, for, for all collections that are provided within Guava and in the JDK, you have this method. Additionally, on top of that, you have the transform method. But the transform methods do not accept a predicate, but they accept a function. Because the function is something that can ap be applied to, to certain value and then give you a, a different value. So the resulting collection is different than the inputted collection. Again, JDK 8. Right, we have streams. The streams provide the same functionality. Uh, of course, the same functionality works on most of the collections. And to some extent, it works on the Guava collections. But as I said, Guava is built for JDK 6, uh, to be JDK 6 compatible. So now, not everything is really well fitted in, within that uh, frame. Uh, for example, we have this roster. Right, we can stream, filter it out, by uh, filter out the, the mails there and for each of them, print them out. Uh, so th these are kind of operations that we can also do with Guava, but when we have JDK 8, it makes no sense, really. Just use the, the JDK 8 operations. Uh, we also have like the aggregate operations. Again, the same operations are available in Guava. You can still aggregate something. Uh, but here, it's actually a lot nicer. Like we have the stream, filter out, we can map the age, get an average age for each of these persons. A lot cleaner than using the, the, the Guava libraries. Again, you need JDK 8. 
There are a lot of collection goodies. I use this all the time, actually. Unfortunately, unlike some other languages, Java doesn't have certain literals for creating um, uh, maps and also lists, actually. So uh, there was a huge discussion uh, regarding the, the language design, uh, whether or not co uh, uh, collection literals should be added in the, the language. And the end discussion was like, why bother? Um, it will kind of mess up the, the whole compiler. It, it will be, require a lot of work. And the syntax benefit is too small when you can use just utility methods. And everyone was pointing at Goala. Because with Goala, you can create, I don't know, uh, a list quite easily from various of keys. You can create a value using like key one, value one, key two, value two. It's really, really, uh, really simple. Of course, this doesn't work because uh, doesn't work for for a lot of keys and values, because these are if if you see in the background is like uh, uh, operator overloading with I don't know nine arg uh, nine arguments, ten arguments, but it's not more than ten. I use this all the time. It, it's a lot simpler than writing this huge blob of generic things, which is like really uh, too much. Of course, the diamond operator in JDK 7 helps around this to a certain extent. But then you, you remove the dependency from, from the hash map, uh, and uh, you are using directly the map interface, which is a lot nicer than, than, than uh, using uh, the specific uh, the specific implementation otherwise. Um, otherwise, in the background, this is uh, creation of the hash map is exactly the same as if we have called new hash map. <clears throat> OK. There are tons of utilities for pretty much every common task that you want to do. One of the common things that we want to do is load uh, a file as a, as a stream, as a resource, from the class path. The proper way in Java to do this is to get this class, to get the class loader of this class, and to get the resource uh, on that specific location. That's really the proper way. Because in, in, uh, uh, if the class was loaded by a different class loader, you might end up being in a, in a different uh, class path that you would have expected otherwise. So even though this, this thing is there on the class path, it may not work. This blobby. Uh, syntax is just replaced by the resources get resource class. A lot simpler, a lot cleaner, and a lot nicer. Yet another common test that, that we have uh, during programming is caching. OK, MDP5, it's like quite common. Everyone uses it. It's built in also in the JDK, so it's not really quite big of a problem. Uh, <coughs> Goala provides something called a funnel. So this here is a funnel. So it's the funnel. Funnel is a thing that converts your object into a pr something that's a primitive representation of that object. So so uh, it converts it into a something called primitive thing. So into is something. Uh, it's an object of type uh, primitive uh, thing. Uh, it basically gives you a value that value representation like a hash code of an object. Uh, there is also like a hash code class that provides the same functionality, but for objects, you must use a funnel that, that will kind of explain your object into a hash code. Why would we need this? Why isn't like the standard hash code enough? If we need to, rec to, to have different hash codes depending on certain parameters, for, usually it's for performance reasons, then we need to provide a separate hash code representations for different objects. Uh, let's look at an, an, an example like this. There is actually a class, um, a probabilistic, uh, um, probabilistic data structure called the Bloom filter. So <clears throat> let's suppose we have uh, this friend list of customers. Um, we, we create this Bloom filter using this customer funnel. So customer funnel is, again, the, the thing that converts our customer to a number, so to, an, to a number. 
Uh, this parameter is the expected number of, of uh, entries, and this is the, the probability of which we have certain expectancy. We, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. So if we go to the uh, friends list and put them inside the, the Bloom filter, then we have a populated Bloom filter. And on that populated Bloom filter, we can actually check if something might be contained into our collection. So we say awesome customer might contain that strange guy. So this customer here. If that method is fulfilled, that means that this strange guy is not really um, a customer, and we need to, uh, it's not really a customer, it's not a customer, and that we might need to test if he really is. <clears throat> Why would we actually use something like might contain? Performance reasons. Quite simple, actually, performance reasons. If we have like a huge list, of course, for two, two customers, it doesn't make sense. But if we have like huge list uh, of customers, or we have like, data that cannot fit into a memory, it's a lot simpler to actually check if something that, that, that's not there. So the Bloom filter will provide us uh, with something, with a value it, that is not there quite fastly, because it provides, uh, it provides, it contains only the hash codes. It contains the hash code representation of each of the objects. Let's see it in a diagram. It, it probably will be clearer there. So we do a check. We say, do you have the key? No. Then we are sure that this customer is not part of our customer base. But if the Bloom filter says yes, then it's there. But sometimes for yes, that also can be a false positive. So that's the probability aspect of it. So if the Bloom filter says yes, then we actually have to do the expensive operation. We have to do the database call or the network call. I have used this quite often for, for network calls, and it provides like huge performance benefit. You need uh, a use case where, where you need to test against something uh, that's huge and uh, to check if something is not there. It will pro provide you a huge performance benefit just because of the hash code. But you really need to be careful writing the hash code that uh, the, the hash code representation, the funnel representation of the object, is really representative uh, and unique for that object. It's a huge, huge performance benefit. OK, <clears throat> so when to use Go, like collections, utilities, always. For me, for most of the business applications, first thing I do is set up the logging. The other part is adding Goala. Because most likely, like, there is no chance that you're not going to need some of this. Um, of course, I don't know if you're doing some application that, that's embedded or has some specific memory requirements or you really want to stay away from dependencies, then you can actually re-implement most of this. Like, actually, 90% of this, it's really easy to implement but it's really nicer there because it's well-tested and so on. Which brings me to the point really why, why you use Goala. You can do it yourself, right? You can do most of the stuff yourself, but with Goala and actually other utility libraries, you have something that's open source. Other developers have already uh, solved the issues that you have, you have fixed. And even if you fix an issue, you are affecting a huge community. Unfortunately, Goala is a Google project, so there are a really handful of contributions from the outside. Most of the contributions are in, in I don't know, the issue tracking system, where there are certain discussions there. Uh, so if you really decide to contribute something, it's most likely not going to end up being a code, but it will be a complaining of something or uh, finding a bug in some of the, some of the libraries. <clears throat> there is actually tons of stuff that I didn't mention. Uh, there is a whole event bus, uh, I don't know, publish, subscribe mechanism. There are a whole bunch of input output utilities, uh, reflection, uh, math. There is a representation of ranges that, that I skipped entirely because really it, it's too much to handle. Even like this, it's too, too, too much to handle. But uh, yeah, you, you need some kind of library like this, and this is really uh, a nice layer on top of JDK that you, you need in most of the projects. OK, and I believe we have about 20 seconds. 
for questions. Okay, so um, just one thing. Um, beginning, beginning, end of last year, there was um, a small event that we do in our uh, Java user group. And uh, three of the, the uh, Bulgarian Java user group uh, guys uh, uh, visited us and had a great presentation. And um, I just want to say that it's great that we have uh, a joint, oper uh, joint operation, joint cooperation. And uh, I hope that we're going to do some event together. There are already some discussion like that. And if you're not really members of, of the Bulgarian Java user group, like join it right away. It's great for the community. It's great for your career. Uh, it's also great for the companies that you work for. It, it uh, builds up the culture within, uh, within the, the city. And, and um, uh, you, you get a lot better developers just by having this type of events. OK, that's it. Thank you.